Hi everyone and welcome back to NIPS, the podcast. I'm your host, Milanist. And I'm Paul Antonio and this is where we discuss calligraphy, lettering and sign painting. <laughs> Here we are, Paul, officially the third episode, I guess. Second episode. <laughs> no, uh, last week we recorded the What? second. Oh yeah, the third episode, okay. <laughs> Oh, your memory is not good. Okay. I'm ill. I'm ill, Milan. You know, yeah. I have co- you know. Yeah, you actually, yes, yesterday, no, last week you got vaccinated. <laughs> yeah, I did. My arm's really hurting. That's crazy. That's crazy. But in, today, in today's uh, uh, week episode, we'll be discussing, we'll continue to talk about how to start calligraphy. Uh, we'll talk also about tools and... And uh, what your favorite script is. Yes. That's cool. Okay, so we continue with how to start calligraphy. Right, we start with this topic first? Yes. So so last time we, we started talking about how we both started. Um, and maybe this time I'll talk a little bit about how I start students off. Okay, that'd be cool. So what, what I tend to tell people, because people say, oh, I want to learn calligraphy. <laughs> that's, that's great, you want to learn calligraphy. <laughs> What, what kind of calligraphy do you want to learn? Oh, this beautiful one with the... <laughs> and so that's, that, that's your starting point. Okay. It's not just about picking up a tool and writing with it. You, you have to, you, you, Me? not us, not <laughs> us, you. You need to do some research because you contact people and say you want to start calligraphy, but you have no idea what you're asking. What script do you want to start with? Is it a pointed nib script? Is it a broad edge nib script? Is it a marker? Is it a flange tool like an oblique holder? Is it a brush pen? What type of brush pen? So, you know, do some research. You'll find that if you ask a calligrapher, how do I start brush copper plate? You'll get a much easier response because then we're not having to guess what you're trying to figure out. Mm. Take some But time, do some. So the, the best way to do it is Do a search for calligraphy online and you'll see lots of stuff come up. Chances are, unfortunately, it'll mostly be modern calligraphy. Mm -hmm. But the reason why I say unfortunately is because it's not a proportionate screen grab. Um, and what, look what through what you're seeing. So, so if you do a search for calligraphy, mostly modern calligraphy comes up on the screen. You don't see a lot of brush lettering. You don't see different types of brush lettering. You don't see different types of broad edge scripts. You don't see ruling pen scripts. You don't see historical scripts. So you'll, you'll need to scroll down a little bit. And from there, take a little screen grab and say, oh, I like this one. I like this one. I like this one. I like this one. And once you figure out what you sort of like. Or just go then, to Calligraphy Masters and see all the different posts. <laughs> or, or go to Calligraphy Masters and see all the different. That's a good thing, Milan. Yes. Maybe that's a really good thing we should do on Calligraphy Masters. We should do a little, this is this, this is this, this is this, this is this. Okay. Yeah. Remember And so, it. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll write it down. Yes. <laughs> Number 455 to remember for Milan. <laughs> okay, come on, Paul. Like, <laughs> am I really that bad? No, I'm, I'm only kidding. We only had about 200. Um, <laughs> so so once, you, once you figure out what you like, th there's no point in you learning something you don't like because you will not invest the time in it. So once you figure out what you like, it might be based on, and, and, and don't forget, this is, this is based on you. It is based on what you like, not what I like or what Milan's li Milan likes. It's a script that, is a, that you are attracted to. Mm. Now, just be careful because you know, if, 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 if it's about the color, It's, it's a problem, you know, you know, gold and people see pretty colors and they're like, oh, I want to learn that. And they don't actually know, like the script, right? So look at the script. What is the script telling you? Is it, can you feel it? Can you feel it around your heart? Because when you look at a script, sometimes you, you feel it because, you know, calligraphy is centered around our heart chakra. It's, it's centered to the way that we love ourselves because it's, it's, It has a rhythmic resonance with humans because, you know, our societies wouldn't exist if we didn't write. So writing is a, a big part of, of the human condition. 
Society so wouldn't look. exist if we didn't write this song so cool. <laughs> That's the quote of the week, Paul. <laughs> so, so start off with trying to feel what's happening around your heart. You look at a script and you're like, oh, that's, that's lovely. Or you look at it and you go, oh, no, no, no. Immediately go for the one that you love and, and then do some research. What is this? And then you, you have a better sense of what you're looking to learn. Once you understand what you're looking to learn, you can figure out what the tools are. And once you can figure out what the tools are, you can get, you can get started on the learning process. You know, don't ask somebody, don't say to somebody, oh, I really want to learn calligraphy because we have no idea what you want to learn. So the responsibility really is on you. You know, you, you, have, to, you have to figure out what it is you want to learn. From there, you can figure out the tools. And, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Tools, which is, you know, possibly nib, nib ink, paper, or it might be a brush pen. Remember, not all brush pens work with every piece of paper. Um, so, and, and then from there, you can sort of, you can make a decision on who to follow. Well, obviously, you know, follow Calligraphy Masters and me and Milanist. <laughs> but just don't, just don't message Milan, okay? <laughs> No, <laughs> you're making me curse again. You right? can you can you can message calligraphy masters, but don't message my lad, okay? Um, and so once and and you know, there's tons of calligraphers out there. There's tons of there's tons of team members in the calligraphy mem masters team who do lots of different scripts. Mm -hmm. um, and and once you start to figure out what you like, uh, and, and you know, it, it it might not even be calligraphy that you like. Mm -hmm. It might be calligraffiti. Or it might be something as crazy as Kali Futurism, which is, you know, what Pokras is really well known for. Um, and, you know, Pokras's work is, you know, the biggest problem with Pokras's work is it's like a, a big hook. <laughs> and he throws it out and he hooks you and that's <laughs> it. You know, you're like, wow, I want to learn this. Uh, Pokras's work is, is, is really different it, it will really rope you in and and then that's what you're fixated on so you, you like poker's work actually? oh my god i love poker's work that's cool, it, that's it cool. really is so innovative and really forward thinking um and you know i i i when i was finishing up rygate i i wanted to write like brody Neuenschwander, or i wanted to write like thomas ingmeyer and you know i wanted to do the work that dennis brown does and their stuff is so contemporary real contemporary calligraphy yes. and i i sort of had to make a decision i sat myself down and i thought you know what you're not going to live for 500 years you only have 60 years at most so really pick something uh, unless they figure out these telomere how to how to uh, how to re retie the telomeres and extend human life you know i i thought pick pick what you're Pick what you love and concentrate on it. No, my, my, my path to calligraphy is very, very different to many people. You know, I trained as a calligrapher. I trained to read manuscripts. So I have both a very academic and practical and, and physical practical writing structure. Also, I think it's important for people to know that uh, when they want to start calligraphy, a big amount of the calligraphy online we ex exclude Paul Antonio because he's really one one of the very few people who never speeds up his uh, calligraphy. But my point is, uh, a lot of people, they think uh, you need to write super fast or that it is very easy. First of all, calligraphy, it's not, uh, you're not writing it as fast as most of you probably have seen videos of. And second of all, it's not as easy as it looks. It, it takes a lot of time. It takes a, a lot of uh, a love for calligraphy, for letters, dedication, and not giving up. Those are things that you don't see in the videos. You see the beautiful results. Yeah, they, that can hook you. But uh, even before you consider starting, keep in mind you need a lot of determination, consistency, and love for this in order to happen. You know those posts, those posts that you see us do. You're only seeing one post. <laughs> you're not seeing the ten or twelve times that we've tried to get it looking beautiful. You're, you're only seeing the one beautiful bit. So that's not just 
time. It's also tools and materials and paper and frustration. And what you're seeing in that 60 seconds on Instagram or, you know, a 10 minute section is on YouTube is, 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 is not just that. So Milan makes a really great point about being aware that, you know, it, it, it takes patience. If you think you're just going to sit there and magic will happen, you know, I know, I know, I know lots of people look at a, a pen staff and see, think a wand, right? You know, but it's, it's not a wand. It's not magic. It takes time and patience. So once you've figured out the script, my, my, my direction is this, and this, this might not appeal to a lot of you, but this is where my students find that they love my teaching because of this. I do a, a, a lecture on the Tuesday. So my, my workshops on a, are on a Sunday and I do a lecture on the Tuesday covering the history of the script. So we talk, I talk about the, his, the history of the script, where it comes from, where it sits in the pantheon of calligraphy, of calligraphic letter forms, why it looks the way it looks, how it evolves, because I feel that having that kind of historical background really gives you context for the learning. Now, some of you might just be interested in writing pretty letters, and that's fine. If your interest is just to make pretty letters, then great. Then at least you have an interest. If your interest is to make really accurate letter forms, that's a very different path you're taking. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a, a lot around this, this topic about, about getting started with calligraphy. And then once you get to the point where you're ready to, to write, you know what it is, you might know the tools and materials. You'd be surprised how many of us will actually help you if you come to us and say, I, I like this script and how do I find this, you know, the information for this. There's a ton of content online. But There's well, a ton be, of content on, on Calligraphy <laughs> Masters. Be very careful what you say. Like you ask people to come and ask, but <laughs> I'm, I mean... But, but what, what, is the worst, what is the worst somebody can say to you? It's no, uh, no, but uh, what I mean is just don't go spam people. Like, if you want, no, don't, spam, oh no, don't spam people. If you know. contact people, you come with a specific question and things that you're don't, clear don't about. For, don't forget to start that by saying, Hi, my name is so and so. I hope you're well. I like your work. You know, don't just go, What pen are you using? Because that, that really annoys me. You know, I'm talking from my personal experience. If you do that to me, I just I block you. Yes. Because yes, if no. you have if you have no respect for contact, you are contacting a stranger and you're not even going to say hello. All you're going to do is ask for a question. You, you want an answer. I want this from you as opposed to saying, hi, you know, how are you? You know, so courtesy really goes a long way. And I'm, I'm really, really adamant about this because it's it's rude. It's mm -hmm. rude to just demand of us when you are asking us to do a favor for you. All you need to do is say hello, be nice, be courteous, and then ask your question. The worst we can do is uh, me, when I'm, I'm busy, I say, I really can't help you right now. Can you message me back in X number of days or something? Because, you know, we're not just sitting there waiting for you to message us. You know, we have our own stuff to do and we're happy to help. But if you are discourteous, there is no way you're going to get help. No, you're most probably okay. gonna get a. <laughs> Just... no. This was is that, is that off? The, is that off the camera? <laughs> no, this is a, a censored version of a <laughs> of a middle finger. <laughs> Just kidding, guys! Come on, we can. Uh, <laughs> so we, all like, right, we we have 15 minutes are over. I don't know. Maybe yeah. I think there is still a lot to talk about this topic, so we'll continue about how to start calligraphy next episode. But uh, before we jump to the second part, I want to promote something of myself. Yay! It's a product uh, which I got uh, two weeks ago. It's a mount for uh, artists. The, uh, it helps me a lot. It helps me right now. Even I'm using it to record myself. But uh, it's something that I've been waiting to have for a very long time. It's something that uh, helps a lot creators, people like me, calligraphers or artists, to record your videos. It's a super useful amount. Uh, you can uh, get uh, a discount for 20% by using uh, Calligraphy Masters as a code. And uh, you can check them on uh, www.arcon.com. 
Oh, Archon Mount. www.archon.com, 20% off with code Calligraphy Masters. So the Archon Mounts are excellent. I yes. cannot tell you how amazing they are. I have two. Yeah, really? Yeah. This is the best for like, uh, seriously, I saw it uh, like... Which, which one do you have? The I, the most expensive one, <laughs> the hundred and forty version. Do you, yeah. do you have the Do you have the the the, the uh, Let me see if I can swing it around here. Do you have this one? It's the one for a phone with the iPad option. Do you oh. have the the tubular wait. steel one? Wait, wait. Here you can see. Oh yeah. Okay, I have that one too. <laughs> That's cool. I like. I'm promoting Arcon, and I don't even know that. Yeah, I mean, I, Aaron. Aaron's made an exceptional product. So this is one of. The, so this, this should only really be a minute, but I think this will take us 15 minutes. It's not cheap, but you get 20 percent off. <laughs> but apart from getting 20 percent off, you will never need another mount ever again. Yes. So even though it's not cheap. You know all those stupid little mounts you buy and you're bending them and they break. Okay, add those up and you would have you would have been able to buy one. The great thing about the Archon mount is, so that that the two versions of them. One is a tubular steel one, which is great for um, for a camera, and the other one is the one that Milan has, which obviously rises up and down, mm -hmm. and it has these little segments that, yes. that bend at different angles. The clip that, that Archon is de designed for the phone is exceptional. It goes in easily. It comes out easily. You know, you're not dropping your phone and looking like a fool when you're trying to film something. And, um, and I have mine clamped to a desk. So my, I, I have four little arms. You, mm -hmm. you might have three, two or three. Yeah, I think three. Um, I have four because my, my desk is much further away. I, I, I don't have anything clamped to the desk that I write on because it, it moves. Um, and they have an attachment that goes onto the pole of the mount for your iPad. So there, there are lots of apps that you can use for this. I'm, I'm just about to talk to these guys who run something called Switcher Studios. And they have an app that they work, Arcon works with them on this. And you can set up like a phone here, plus your iPad and you could film from both. Ah, oh, amazing. Yay, Archon. <laughs> Brilliant, Archon mounts. Archon forever, 20% okay, so off with Calligraphy Masters code. Okay, I, I, I have my own 20% off code, but buy it from Milan. <laughs> I didn't, you have also Archon code? Of course I have a code. What kind of nonsense <laughs> are you talking about? Okay, Take you, the pen out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you can promote your code in the next episode. <laughs> But okay, let's jump into the next section talking about your favorite scripts. So, it, does it have to be one's favorite script or? I don't. I, I, don't, I, uh, mm, mm -hmm. I don't really have a favorite script. I, I have. I, I have. Okay, well, let's talk. You you talk first. Uh, but I, I I'm uh, my my favorite. Make sure you're calling it by the right name. Huh? <laughs> My favorite script is English roundhand. <laughs> I'm, really? just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it's not a script. <laughs> of course uh, it is. English roundhand is a script. No, what was the font? English? Oh, old English. Old English. No, I didn't even uh, make the You're joke so properly. lucky I'm not there because I would clout you <laughs> so hard behind your head. Oh, <laughs> English but, round Okay, this, besides the joke, uh, my favorite script is Fracture, of course. I don't know. Like, mm. uh, this is the first that, I mean, maybe I'm influenced by Tews, but uh, part of his video, I actually fall so much in love because I really loved uh, Fracture. And uh, his fracture, I know it's not traditional fracture, it's, it's not with the rules and everything, but this is actually what made me fall and what made me want to make uh, stuff like this. I, I didn't start calligraphy with the idea, oh, I want to make this uh, the traditional correct letters. Of course, I want now, yeah, I want mine to do them, but uh, since day one, I, I wanted to have this kind of your own fracturish uh, hand, which is so much, it, it's beautiful for me. I, I just fell in love with it. Well, <laughs> you know, fracture is the reason I chose 
to become a scribe as well. Really? Yeah. You know, when I was nine, there was this book that I came across. Where is it? Uh, David Harris's The Art of Calligraphy. And I opened the book in the bookstore. This was the only book on calligraphy on the whole island of Trinidad, right? And I opened the book and right where I opened it, it opened onto a double page spread of, um, of a manuscript designed for Maximilian I by Albrecht Dürer. And I, you know, I still feel what I felt when I, I, I open it and I just, it was like light from heaven shining on the book with angels singing. And, and I, when I think back of that memory, it's so clear. It's like, I'm, it's like I'm a child again. And that made, and I turned to my mother and I, this is the other part of the memory. I turned to my mother and I said, that, that, that's what I want to do. And she was like, what? <laughs> she was so confused. I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And she was like, what are you talking about, child? <laughs> but I knew that this is what I wanted. <laughs> and I hunted for a facsimile of the manuscript. There are only 900 copies. Okay. And I have a facsimile in the studio. I shown you this manual, this manuscript. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And uh, when the British Library were having an exhibition of the largest exhibition of Albrecht Dürer's work, I was giving a talk um, and they had to borrow my copy because not even the British Library has a copy. Um, <laughs> and it's, Fracto is a, is a beautiful script. The, the thing about Fracto is it's not a first hand to learn. Well. So when I teach, I, I generally teach uh, one of two things. I either teach my version of Italic, which is very simplistic, mm -hmm. or I teach Textualis Quadrata. So people call Textualis Quadrata black letter or Gothic. It's not. Mm -hmm. So there's there's names for the scripts that understanding the names really helps you to, to understand oh, what you need. Maybe this is something good to talk in next episode, something about this, uh, yeah. Uh, terminology names. yeah exactly i have it actually written on my paper but yeah just which, which number is it <laughs> <laughs> um so textualis quadrata is the basis of the scripts in the gothic period and it's very regimented it's simply you know a quadrant a lozenge a down stroke that's it simple mm. simplish fractor is essentially quadrata with curves so instead of coming straight down on the verticals you have a little curve and learning quadrata first changes your approach to fractal because it really allows you to, to understand the structure of the script. So you mean that if I learn now quadrata, my fractal will, will improve? Yes, tremendously. So I'll, I'll send you the link. You know, I, we, we, did a, we did a fractal class last month. Mm -hmm. I'll send you the link for it on Teachable and just watch it and study along with it and your fractal will change like that but there's the thing now, that now the I... thing about fractal is this right so so milan's talking about his fractal and it's really important that you understand that word his he also talked about tioson's fractal so tioson is an amazing guy super talented tattoo artist brilliant lettering artist um and his fractal is beautiful but it is not historical fracture. So Tiosan's fracture is a contemporary version of fracture, which is amazing. But if you're looking at Tiosan's fracture and that's what you're trying to do, you will struggle because Tiosan has a great understanding of Gothic scripts and he's gone through that process of textualis quadrata into fracture. And so fracture for me is, 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 is never a good starting point because <laughs> It's too difficult to learn without previously learning textualis quadrata. Now, it's great to look at it and go, I, I want to do that. And this is where the learning starts to, you know, this is where we come back to the how to start calligraphy. 
But this is, you know, it's just this just to prove if you remember what I said last week. I'm doing everything the wrong way, and now I just found out that I started with what I'm not supposed do you, to. Start. Do you not remember? So, so Milan came to stay with me last year, <laughs> right? And we were we were sitting down having dinner at home, and I, I I was just talking with him, and he he looks up, and I said, "What's the matter?" And he goes, "You've just changed everything that I knew about calligraphy." <laughs> And we, you know, we would we would stay up until like you know, we stayed up for like three or four hours talking about calligraphy and what it is and my perception of it and and at the end of you know I said we need to go to bed because I need to work tomorrow um, and you know it's I I have a very different experience of calligraphy and being able to to look at Milan's experience of it it's it's we're really on two completely opposite ends of the scale hmm. and and that's great because it allows you to have a very um, playful approach to it mm -hmm. from the lens side, but it also allows you to have a very structured approach to it from my side. And, you know, Melen's been studying, he's been playing with his fractal, and it really is his fractal. You know, it's not an historical script, and it's not Tiosan's fractal either. It's his version of fractal. Really? Wait, I'm just, you really think like this? Yeah, it, it has very specific idiosyncratic shapes and structures and movements. Um, That's and... super nice. I'm sorry, like, I'm happy because, you know, sometimes when I do my fracture, like, I'm influenced by Tio Swan, and sometimes I think, oh, I, I don't know, but in my head, maybe people think it's similar. That's why I don't really upload much. But now hearing this from you, this is so nice. But like, like the table that you just redid, right? Oh, the table but... that you just redid was... It was interesting seeing the process because it helped me to see more of how you do the writing. Mm -hmm. Now, if when I teach, what I, I, I obviously I, I, I work on an historical basis because that's that's where my passion lies in historical script work. I do contemporary work too, um, but you'll mainly see my, my historical stuff. Um, so when I teach, what I do is I teach textualis quadrata as it's the basis of the scripts in the Gothic period. Then I teach Fractual. Then I teach this script called uh, Lettre Pougogne, which is a, like a French script, which relates to Batard. And from there, I will teach uh, Italian Rotunda. So those are your four major scripts in the Gothic period. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there are lots of others, there are lots of others you know. Um, so this is, this is Milan just nodding because he didn't, he didn't attend the lecture that I did on the history of the Gothic scripts, right? But that's okay, Milan. We'll we'll deal with that after this 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 episode. Um, we have, so we have two minutes having, left. <laughs> having this structure is really important. Now, once you have the structure, you should always have an historical script and your version, mm -hmm. because your version is not going to be the historical script. Your version is going to have your own little idiosyncrasies, your own little character traits creeping into it and that that's how you develop your own calligraphy you don't develop it by just looking mm -hmm. you develop it by studying the historical and then playing with it but having them separate is really important because then you then what you develop for yourself can be really quite fascinating we have to finish with this part, but uh, I said my favorite script, but I, I don't uh, recall you telling your favorite script. So we'll talk about that in the next episode. Okay, oh, oh, oh. next episode. So is it tools now? Tools again? So let's go back to tools. Yeah, tools. 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 So in the last episode, we talked about something with, which really shocked Milan. <laughs> the oh, fact <yeah>. that <laughs> not everything will work together. Yes. And there are a number of reasons for this. So that there are ways around it. So for instance, <coughs> there is a, a binder which we use in ink called gum Arabic. Gum Arabic is the main binder for ink, gouache, and watercolor. You, I'm going to tell you something and probably, I don't know, either you're going to laugh or you're going to kill me. <laughs> I have two bottles of gum arabic for like i don't know it's probably more than three four years now oh, so, so double check because they, it, it ages and if it if it ages too much it it, it won't work the thing is it i lose. i never used it because 
Uh, you didn't know I, what to do with it. I'm I'm too lazy to go on YouTube and see how to use it. <laughs> so gum Arabic comes from the acacia tree. Okay. Um, and they score the tree, like how they make rubber, because they score the rubber trees and they collect the rubber. Mm -hmm. They score the acacia tree and they collect the gum. And the gum is an amazing binder. Now, <clears throat> that whenever you have a whenever you have a, f a writing fluid, you always have a pigment, a carrier, and a binder. So the pigment is the color. The carrier is usually water, and the binder is usually gum, gum arabic. There are different types of binders. You could use, you know, egg yolk. You can use um, what? Egg yolk. Yeah. Oh yeah, egg yolk's great for a binder. It's it's what they used to paint with in the in the Middle Ages. That's but why the, the the manuscripts have this glossy look to them. I have another stupid question, but I'm not English. What's a binder like? What's the purpose of this binder? So the binder binds the pigment to the paper. Okay. That's why when you write with something that doesn't have enough binder, you can brush off the pigment. You know, okay, um... like like when you when you when you mix up gold. If you mix too much water in the gold paste, yes. it comes off because there's too much carrier. So there's a proportional scale of binder to carrier to, to pigment that you need. Okay, and I that's that's how that's how they that's how it works, right? I get so it. So gum arabic is 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 the standard binder that we use to bind a pigment. The water is a carrier, so my so I've come up with this really great sort of system for teaching people about color, about writing. I I don't I I hate people guessing. You know, if it's one thing I, I that really drives me crazy is somebody saying, "Oh, do it like make it do it like this," because of course, their this is never ever going to be your this. So explain explaining exactly why something works is really important because then you're not having people guessing and getting stressed and frustrated. So I've come up with this, this scale, and this is how it works. If you're, so gouache is a dense watercolor, which is essentially pigment with white to make it solid on a surface, plus water as the carrier and gum arabic as the binder. If you are painting heraldry or you're painting an area and you want a nice solid color, then the liquid needs to be the consistency of single cream. So that's that's quite thick. So you're using a paintbrush. And what you do when you're painting gouache is you paint the outline and then you flood the color. And as soon as all of the color touches itself, it goes solid. And so it dries as a solid block. So that's that's painting with gouache. But can you, Damien, do you use also gum arabic in the gouache if you use it, for example, with a broad edge pen? Or is it only with the paint brush? Okay, so let, let me get through the, the consistency first. Okay. The next thing is, if you're writing with a broad edge nib, the, the gouache needs to be thinned to the consistency of full fat milk. So that's much thinner than single cream, but it's still a little bit thickish. Mm -hmm. But it flows much more easily. Now, the reason for that is when you write with a broad edge nib, the ink has to flow down the ink channel and across the nib. And if, if, it, if it's too thin, then you won't have enough coverage. But if it's too thick, it'll just clump on the nib. So 100% so full fat milk. If you're doing copper plate script, you want the ink to be the consistency of 2% milk or semi-skimmed milk. And if, you, if you're doing something like Spencerian script, which requires really thin ink, you want the ink, the, you want the, 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 the writing fluid to be the consistency of 0% fat or skimmed milk. So that's really thin and it flows very quickly. So that's, that's how I, te I teach my students about consistency of, of, of flow. Now, the other thing that you do is if you're writing with gouache, don't start writing a big block of text with it. Get the same piece of paper, mix up the gouache, do a little test, and then once it's dry, rub it. If the color comes out, it doesn't have enough binder, so it's not binding to the surface. 
Mm. So it means you need to add a little bit more gum arabic to it. So what we do is we normally take a brush, dip it in the bottle really quickly, down and up, and then you get it'll drip, and you'll need maybe two or three drops of that. Mm. Don't use a syringe. <laughs> Don't use a, a pipette. It's too much. This is your best way to drop, dip, and drop. And then stir with the back end of the brush, not the front. So once you've done that, you might need to add a little bit more water because the gum arabic will make it thicker. Hmm. So you need a little bit more water to help it flow better. You're not adding more pigment. You're only changing the, the, the ratio of binder to carrier to pigment and so so that that's that's how that works all right so now once you have that now okay so so that's using gouache to write with what about if you're using ink because some inks are really thin and they if the paper has a little coating or a little gloss on it the ink might stick to the paper so a little bit of gum arabic in the ink like a fountain pen ink will increase the ink's ability to bind to the paper What? <laughs> so, so like a fountain pen ink. So this is so I, I on my desk I have some Tom Norton's walnut ink. Okay. It's very very thin. Yeah. So it's like the consistency of zero percent fat or skimmed milk. It slides <laughs> off the off the off the nib very very quickly. It's great for Spencerian script or really fast sort of my copper plate script is quite quite quick. Um. So I need the ink to flow as quickly as I'm working. Okay, uh, I have a question, quick question, yeah, like, if I, if I want to write quick with a pointed nib, which should be the nib, or it doesn't matter? It's not the nib, or is it the ink? So, so that comes back to the ink nib paper question. Um, <laughs> because, for instance, a blue pumpkin nib, so I, I, I very rarely use blue pumpkin nibs, because my, the thing that I love the most about a pointed nib is, um, is the fineness of the hairlines. Yes. And a blue pumpkin nib doesn't produce really fine hairlines. But it's also about the relationship of the thickness. What you're looking for? I'm looking for my nibs, but I can't find them. I have like a bunch of this Gelot uh, 3. Gelot 3 or 3? Yeah, probably they're like uh, silver color. They're very, very, they're silver. I mean, I don't, the color, I mean, they're not golden lookish. Like if some they're silver. If if you have Gelot 303 nibs which are silver, you only got them from me because they don't they don't sell those. I think I got I'm, them. From I'm the Amazon. only one. I'm the only person who has the silver 303s. No, I got them from Amazon <laughs> or scribblers. Then not... then they would be blue. No, <laughs> I will I will search them later. I can't find them right now. The 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 silver 303s. I, I have them from from Gelot because I was testing. I was testing something that was happening with the nib and they're silver because they're not fired as yet. When they're fired, they turn blue. So that's oh. what that the blue ones are on the market. You will never get a silver one. But I don't know what's wrong with mine. I, I've used my sal saliva. Saliva, yeah. And, uh, but probably, I don't know, maybe the ink was not correct. I tried with watercolor and uh, my nibs, they did, uh, I just left them because there was some. So what, what I do when I when I prepare a nib, which, which I mean, that's, that's a whole other kettle of fish. <laughs> when I prepare a nib, I spit on a piece of tissue. Yes. And I leave the nib in the saliva, or I just for how long time? Yeah, I do it because I've seen it from you. But how long? Does... Five, five minutes. Five minutes. Oh, maybe that's. So <laughs> usually, let me get a new nib so I don't get ink in my mouth because <laughs> you know that seems to be that that's seems my, to be that's my job. That everybody, yeah, that's your job. <laughs> so. Um, so this is a Hunt 99. So what I normally do is when I'm writing, I would lick the tip of the nib. Careful. Then, <laughs> but I'm not normally talking. No, but then, just, if somebody does it. I leave it there. And I'm setting up my table. But so I don't recommend this doing people. Please don't do it, please. Don't, don't shove it in your mouth because you can stick yourself. I, I, I suggest you put it on a piece of tissue and spit on it. 
the saliva will get rid of it. And people are like, oh, but it's it's spit. It's your spit. <laughs> come on. You people. swallow it. You swallow it every 30 seconds. I mean, seriously, come on. You know, <laughs> the reason why the reason why I, I tell people not to use anything else is the great thing about saliva is it's always there. And it's free. And it's free, right? <laughs> People are like, oh, but I use Windolene, or I use that. The Windolene will destabilize the ink if you don't, don't ever stick it in a potato because if you stick a sharp nib into a potato, it will damage the tip. The tines will get damaged and the nib will not do what it's supposed to do. So this nonsense about sticking nibs in potatoes, I mean, really go and cook the potato instead. You'll get a much better use for it. Fried um, nibs. <laughs> so you have a nib, you spit on it. The saliva is slightly acidic. So it takes a little bit longer. Acids, you know, any kind of cleaning solvent can also affect the metal. Uh, never, ever, under any circumstance, put a nib through a flame. Because oh, yeah. <laughs> if you put the nib in a flame, they've already heated the nibs. But who the came up with has... stupid idea? I've seen like so many places and people are doing this. Why? Why? Who? You who did this? It, Oh, you, you know, you know, the funniest thing about people and nibs, I was I was teaching a class once and I, I didn't think to tell the students don't put the, 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 the nib in a flame. Somebody in the class was holding the nib and put. Oh, my God. And I, I was standing at the front of the class and I said that 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 is a very stupid idea. And she was like, this is how I always do it. And I said, OK, you continue holding a piece of metal while you're heating it and see what happened. And she started chatting with me and then she goes, oh, 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 because of course it's, it's metal, it gets hot, <laughs> you know. But anyway, don't put the nib in a flame. The nib has already been heated. If you heat it again and, you know, you heat it until it's red hot and you put it in the ink and it goes, Pff! you've just, you've just changed the temp of the nib. So the nib, the tip will wear away very quickly. The reason why you shouldn't put a nib in a flame is this. When you put, especially a pointed nib, when you put a pointed nib, in, when you put a pointed nib in a flame, the tip is so, it heats up faster than you can see it heating up. So by the time you can see it hot, it's, it's already ruined. Right. So never, ever put your nibs in a flame. You know, I, I, I spit on mine. I leave them there. I go and get a glass of water and do whatever I need to do. I come back. I set my desk up. I take them out. I clean them. And then I put it into the holder. And it'll work. It wouldn't work on something like a G-nib because they are really coated. But we'll deal with that some other time. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, with your nibs, you, if you, and people say to me, oh, but I, I brush it with, with toothpaste. Are you, are you gentle enough to know that you've not damaged the tines? So, you know, it's all about, it's all about care with the nib and the saliva is the safest thing. It's all about you know, being it's gentle. Pause, it's free, you know, <laughs> just, you know, just be happy, happy with your nibs. Happy nibs equal happy, happy writing. Happy calligraphy, happy people <laughs> and happy listeners and watchers. Uh, thank you guys for being uh, with. Uh, thank you guys for being with us for another episode. How to say this? <laughs> okay, thank Slowly. you guys for watching. Thank you for listening. Uh, it's been fun to have another episode. If I don't know where you listen or watch us, follow, subscribe, comment, everything, share <laughs> with your friends, <laughs> with your family. <laughs> This is a joke, but yeah, thank you guys. Um, and just just remember, um, wherever you're following, if you can leave a comment, if you can't leave a comment where you're following, then follow us on Instagram. There's a Nibs a Nibs link, Nibs, um, podcast. Nibs podcast on Instagram. Please leave a message uh, and tell us what you want us to talk about. And we're happy to listen to your questions and present some information on that. Yes, and that's it for today, guys. We talk to you. See you next week again. And as always, Paul. Keep writing. Yes. <laughs> Keep writing. <laughs>